like to invite the children to come forward for a kids chat. You're bringing your pet. It's a dragon. It's a dragon. One two, that's a test, you know. Okay. Okay, boys and girls. Have a question for you. What is bread? Yeah. See, see what kind of answers they get. You want to go first? It's food. Food. Good. The bread of life. The bread of life. Very good. And Food. Good food. Good food. Yes. Bread. Bread is bread. Okay. Yeah. Is it good with cheese? Good with cheese. Yeah. And. Okay. Well, when we think of bread, we think of food, of substance. There's a very good answer here. What do you see? You said about Jesus is the bread of life. Yeah, he is the bread of life. And we can think of, think of Jesus in that spiritual sense. I'm going to give you a little different perspective on bread today. One day, one of Jesus' disciples, he said, how should I pray then? How should I pray? John the Baptist, he taught his disciples how to pray. How do you want us to pray? And Jesus began what we traditionally today think of as the Lord's Prayer. And that begins, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. bread. Do you think that's for a sandwich? Yes. <laughs> I don't think so. Other things. Well, in the context of that application, what Jesus was telling his disciples is to pray for what you need every day. Only pray for what you need one day at a time. God will provide for tomorrow. So, if we pray for what we need today, what's that mean? What does that mean to you? Any thoughts? Yes, your hands up in the air. Oh, okay. Pray for all your food. Pray for the food you need that day. Yes, Katie? It's kind of like that saying on the TV. Only pray what you need, but instead of pay, it's pray. Okay. Pray for what you need. That's very good, Katie. So that's what God was saying. God is a God of provision. You know, we take so much for granted. We take for granted the air we breathe, the water we drink. He gives us so many things, and he wants us to think in terms of our daily existence in the same way. We're not to be greedy. We're not to want things that we really don't want. Just take one day at a time. For, pray for daily bread. Pray for not necessarily the food you eat, but more than that, pray for everything that you need, whether it be shelter, clothing, whatever. And I think I'm losing them one by one. So let us, let us have a brief word of prayer, young boys and girls. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you because you are a God of provision and you do provide for us whatever we need. You're a God who loves us so much and you gave us your son, Jesus. And now I would ask that today that these young children, these boys and girls may be filled with your love. In your son's name we pray. Amen. There you go. Our scripture for today's message comes to us from the Gospel of John, the first chapter, beginning in the 35th verse. John 1, 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When they saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. 
So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who was following him. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. May God add his blessing upon this reading of his holy word. There was a student who asked his principal one day, was it really necessary to go through all 12 grades of school? Wasn't there a shorter way to get to graduation? The principal responded, he asked the young man, he said, well, what do you want to be? The principal went on to say, when God makes an oak, it takes 100 years. When he makes a squash, it's less than four months. You know, Christian education, it makes it possible for us to, to stand strong, to stand like a great oak tree. It equips us to grow in knowledge of our knowledge of our Judeo-Christian heritage, and it nourishes us to grow in faith. Christian education, it begins with our babies are us, and it continues on through adult Sunday school. Christian education, it's about studying and worshiping and fellowshipping and equipping to serve others together as a body of Christ. As attested to by the many teachers we have, Christian education is not a one-person job. It takes many people, each focusing on their area of responsibility. And at the end of the day, the sum of the parts come together to form a team. And the work of the team is with purpose. As Paul writes to Timothy, so that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished unto all good works. Christian education, it must be Christ-centered. And Jesus, the master teacher, is the example that we follow. In the Gospels, the four, uh, the four first books of the New Testament, the word teacher is found 45 times. And an additional 14 times we find the word rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus wants to make sure that you get it. He wants you to understand that he came as a preacher teacher so that you could know what it means to follow him, to experience salvation, to have a personal relationship with God. Jesus is divinely equipped to teach He's a master educator. You may recall that story of, at a very young age, about 12, Jesus went to the temple. He was there for Passover with his parents, and when the Passover was over, they left, and as the caravan was about a day away from the temple, Mary and Joseph realized that Jesus was not with them. So they returned to Jerusalem, to the temple, and is recorded in Luke, the second chapter, the 46th verse. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers and listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at the understanding and answers that he offered. Still an adolescent, Jesus began to speak in wisdom and knowledge that came from God. Now let us fast forward about 30 to the point that Jesus is about 30 years of age. And now we're at the Feast of the Tabernacles. And in John 7, we find these words. Halfway through the festival, Jesus went up to the temple courts and began to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? And Jesus answered, my teaching is not of my own. It come from, comes from the one who sent me. That which Jesus taught came from God the Father. His ministry, it was a big drawing card. It, it grew crowds, but the big draw initially were the miracles that he was performing, miraculous healings that were taking place. And as the people were coming and they heard him speak, 
His words were unlike what they had heard from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The people were coming in droves, and as he taught, often he needed to distance himself. He needed to get away from the crowd, and he would do that by getting into a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And from there, he would continue to teach and preach. And in that boat, those whom he was speaking to sat on the banks of the Galilee, and they, they would sit on this, this raised elevation, almost like a uh, kind of a, um, if you will, a, a coliseum or a stadium effect, whereby he could be seen and heard. John Mark records it this way. Mark chapter 3, beginning in the seventh verse. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan from Tyre to Sidon. Because of the crowds, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding in on him, for he had healed many, so that those with disease were pushing forward to touch him. In a similar way, the Sermon on the Mount offers a natural setting for Jesus as he begins to teach the Beatitudes. This time, Jesus is sitting up high elevated on a mountainside. He assumes a position of, a, a position of authority. You might think of Isaiah 6. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty. And in that, that panoramic setting, looking down on the crowd elevated from them, the people are looking up to him. And that's what we do. We look up to God. The people are looking up to Jesus. And Matthew 5 begins, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountainside, sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is those who mourn, for they will be comforted, and so on and so on, as the Beatitudes tell us. And in the seventh chapter, he concludes his sermon saying, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he had taught as one with authority, and not as their teachers of the law. He taught with authority. One of the greatest blessings we have as Christians is we can pray, we can talk to our God. And I've, I've always been fascinated with prayer to the point that along my course of studies, I actually uh, wrote a thesis and a dissertation on prayer. Prayer is about speaking to God and, and people, many people, it's amazing how many people really struggle with that. But it's not unusual. In fact, we're told that, that uh, Jesus, his disciples, his disciples, they had problems. They had struggled with, how should we pray then, Jesus? The, the theme of the Lamb's talk, the, the children's message here this morning. Luke 11 records, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Jesus walked the talk. Jesus prayed. Often in the early in the morning before daylight, Jesus would get off and he, up and he would go off to a, a place of solitude where he could, could spend time with the Lord, where he could talk to him in prayer. The words of institution from our Lord's Supper. He took the bread, he blessed it, he prayed over it, and then he broke it and he gave it to them. It was in the garden where Jesus prayed. Jesus taught us how to pray, and he taught us how to do it by example. Then, through his sacrificial death, the curtain of the temple was torn to and from top to bottom, from heaven to earth, the curtain was tore, through, tore open. Now we no longer have to go through a high priest. Jesus became our high priest. And we could go and we could have prayer, we could talk with our Lord any time we wanted to. Through that, that act of agape love, you 
have a direct line, if you will, to Jesus. Jesus taught us how to pray, and he gave us a model and an example to follow. You know, Jesus' teachings, they're uniquely his. The religious leaders, they resented that he, he taught that faith could be a key ingredient to our healing. He, he taught that he had the authority to, to proclaim the forgiveness of sin. His style of preaching, it was tragically different. He no longer, if we no longer found it necessary to go through a laborious task of, of memorizing the 316 laws. Rather, Jesus introduced a new way of, of learning. He introduced parables. He introduced stories that could be understood, that could be comprehended. Stories that related to the people, the things that people lived, agriculture, commerce. They understood what it meant to have a personal relationship with God. Jesus said, Truly, anything I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God is like a child and will never enter it. Let me say it over again. I don't think I missed a word or two. Anything, anyone, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. The kingdom of God. It belongs to those who have a childlike acceptance of faith and trust. His kingdom belongs to those who accept him with the non-assuming innocence of a child. When his disciples rebuked the children that were responding to Jesus' invitation to come to him, he made it clear that nothing was to hinder that. Nothing was to come between a child and God. Now Jesus was raised in a Jewish home, and as such, his mother would have been expected to provide much of his spiritual training at a very young age. She would have instructed him in prayer. And as a child, he would have been required to memorize Hebrew scripture. One such piece is found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Hear our Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Sound familiar? <laughs> sure. It's foundational words of the great commandment. Jesus understood at a very young age the importance of a child to God. And he understood at a very young age the importance of the relationship between God and a child. In our culture, the church, it, it bridges gaps in Christian education. In our time, in our day and age, Christian education is woefully lacking in the home. The church offers instructions in the ways of our Lord through our children and youth Sunday school, through vacation Bible school, through, through Camp Yelidjwa, through Camp Yelidjwa. And I don't know if everyone knows what that means, so if, don't let me uh, embarrass you if you don't. It means living, youth living Jesus' way. Youth living Jesus' way, Yelidjwa. Through Camp Yelidjwa, our children and youth have an opportunity to develop a special relationship with God, a relationship that is precious. Today, Taryn recognized 13 of our campers. Campers affiliated with Bowmansdale Church of God. Campers that were there this summer. You know, there's something special about that week for a camper. What's special is it's a time when many, for the first time, will come to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that's precious. It was about 10 years ago, Camp Yelidjwa was looking for volunteers. And they had put a plea out to churches and 
won't you consider, we, we need staff people, won't you consider coming up and helping them with a camp for a week? And I thought, camp week, how hard can that be? <laughs> so I signed up for a week, a fourth grade camp, as a, as a team leader. I learned two things that week. The first thing, what a beautiful experience for these young boys and girls. It was times of hiking and swimming and games, time of Bible studies. When evening would come, we would go up to, to Brenneman Chapel, that's the outdoor chapel there. In the chapel we would have praise and worship songs, Ready? if you would have been there, they'd have got you to play your guitar. A lot of guitars, a lot of good music. Time of prayer, message. And then on the lawn, after that, that worship service took place, it's the end of the day, dusk is soon coming. The children would break out in small groups, groups three, five, and the group leader would be their counselor. Now the counselor was the person that they had spent time with all week. This is the person they've lived with, who's been there for them. It's a person that they felt they've developed a relationship with. It's a young person, it's a teen, mostly teen, post-teen, early 20s. It's a person who they have built a relationship, they can confide in this person, they can trust this person. And with this person, they had shared the word of God, they had talked about the challenges that they're facing in life. If you don't think our young people have a tough go of it, you missed the boat. They would talk with these young people about the struggles they were having in everyday life. Troubles that they were having at home. I'm going to date myself. Many of these kids don't come from Ozzy and Harriet Holmes. Many of them live a tough life. You know, we hear about all the problems that kids have today with, we hear about suicide rates, we hear about bullying. It's real. It's out there. And at camp, they were able to confide in their counselor and, and, and share these concerns. I recall one young gal, she was dealing with abuse. And in that setting, in that small group off by the side with their counselor, they would pray. Now I'm not saying the counselor solved their problems, in ca all cases they do. But they allowed them to open up. And it gave a chance to, for that counselor to go back to their pastors in some cases and say, hey, Johnny got a problem here. You need to help out. You know, when it got dark, after the, it's now on the verge of, of getting pretty dark out, the youth with their counselors, they would run, they would migrate from the, the Brenneman Chapel area to a campfire. And it was at the campfire, there would be more songs and there would be schmores and there's a certain synergy taking place and the Holy Spirit is coming alive and working well. It's neat stuff. Karen, if I got, uh, Taryn, if I got my numbers right, five? Five of our youth out of 13 came to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Quite often at that setting, at that campfire, that's where that takes place. It's a place where, where campers and counselors come together. And it's facilitated because we have a camp that is a Christian camp. God is doing great things. If you affirm that, please say amen. Amen. Oh, I said I mentioned two things I learned. Well, this, here's the second. Don't volunteer for fourth grade camp if you're over 55. There's a... Uh, 
if, if you're ever at the gymnatorium down the hallway, they take pictures every year, these big nice pictures of all the campers. They sit up on a bank up by the athletic field and they, I think there are about 300 campers in our group. And they, they get on this bank and they take this group picture. If you're ever there, I'm the easiest one to spot. I'm the only one with white hair. <laughs> I was old enough to be not only the parent of the counselors, but the grandparent <laughs> of all those kids. And by the end of the week, I felt like it. They were high energy. Oh, boy. I slept well when I got home. You know, Jesus invites his disciples into a deeper relationship. Our scripture today from John 1, 41. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah that is Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. At Bowensdale Church of God, we have found Jesus. And we're bringing others to him. The words of the Great Commission from Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, and teaching them to observe everything. I have commanded you. At Bowman's the Church of God, we have found Jesus. And we're bringing others to him, and we're teaching them. As Jesus commissioned his disciple, his disciples. Today we are going to commission our Sunday school teachers and our leaders of COG, affirming that they are empowered by the authority of Jesus Christ in order that they can teach everything that he has commanded. It is through our Christian education program and programs such as Camp Ulidwa that we are following the teachings of Jesus. We're teaching our children, our youth, our adults, everything that he has commanded us. At Bowmansdale Church of God, we have found Jesus and we are bringing others to him. At this time, we're going to commission our educators, our teachers, our, our leaders of COG, and I'd like to invite them to come forward. Bring your bulletin. You will need the insert inside your bulletin. Please come forward. We're going to empower you with the support of your church. rather make everybody do the steps. Why don't you just line up down here and I'm going to come around in front of you because you're talking to them, not to me. Everybody have your, your bulletin already? Okay. And the congregation, you'll, you'll have a response here, so keep your bulletin handy. My beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, do you promise to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received? I do. Do you believe you are led of God to engage in this work and to assume the duties of which you have been called? I do. Do you, in the presence of God and all his congregation, promise faithfully to perform the duties of which you have been called in the church of God? I do. Do you promise to proclaim the good news through words and deeds? I do. Do you promise to serve Christ and his church in a spirit of humility, gentleness, patience, and love? I do. Do you promise to exercise the gifts that God has granted you through the grace, through his grace, to bring peace and unity to the body of Christ? I do. Do you promise to be diligent and faithful in the exercise of your duties, nurturing all in our care to grow in the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ? Thank you. And now to the congregation. Do you, the members of the, this congregation, promise to be loyal to these teachers and leaders whom you have chosen, uplifting them in the holy calling of your prayers and uniting with them in serving Christ and the church? If so, please respond in unison. We recognize... Holy Spirit, and the of Jesus, our brothers and sisters, and 
Now, join me please. Now, therefore, you have been commissioned to serve this congregation. May God grant you the wisdom and the power to be worthy servants of us all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the, the blessing of these who have come forth, who are willing to serve you, to, to be leaders, to take your word out into the world. Lord, we thank you for this great opportunity to have them to serve you, and we ask your blessing upon the work that they do. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Go forth and serve the Lord.